Kazakhstan's president, Kasim Jomar Tokayev, walks through a defense plan and local media cameras linger on a single poster, it is tempting to treat it as routine industrial PR, but that poster is exactly where the story starts because it outlines a 2026 production plan that quietly signals a shift in how Kazakhstan wants to fight, deter, and sell security. The message is blunt. Beskaru says it can build up to 200 armored vehicles a year, and next year it intends to add tracked platforms to that output, specifically the Tulpar family and the Alpa unmanned ground combat complex. And once you say tracked vehicles plus large combat robots, you are no longer talking about a niche procurement cycle. You're talking about doctrine, geopolitics, and a bet on what the next war will demand. At first glance, the industrial part looks straightforward. Beskaru claims annual capacity not only for wheeled vehicles like the Timus 8x8 and Ibar 4x4, but also for tracked Tulpar variants. Yet the real signal is not the number, it is the composition. Tracked vehicles are harder to build and sustain than wheeled ones, and they typically exist to solve specific battlefield problems. Cross-country mobility in bad terrain, greater growth margin for armor and sensors, and a natural home for heavier weapons. So why lean into this now? because the post-2022 battlefield has made one lesson painfully clear. Mobility and protection are not separate variables. They are a single equation that decides whether your forces can close distance under drones, loitering munitions, and precision artillery without being shredded. The poster's illustration hints that Tulpar may be produced in a light tank configuration with Italy's Leonardo Hitfak Maklu turret, first shown in this pairing in early 2024. That turret concept matters because it turns a tracked chassis into something closer to an expeditionary direct fire platform, a 105mm or 120mm gun, a coaxial 7.62 machine gun, and a remotely controlled weapon on the roof. Add a laser warning system and an auto loader with ammunition separated from the crew by an armored compartment and blow off panels, and you get a design philosophy that has one obsession crew survival when the worst happens. In the narrative of modern armored warfare, that is not a luxury feature, it is the entry ticket. Now consider the performance envelope being signaled. A vehicle over 40 tons, up to 70 kilometers per H, around 600 kilometers range, and protection rated to withstand 25 mm armor-piercing rounds from automatic cannons. That is not light in the classic sense, and that is where the M10 Booker comparison becomes unavoidable. The Tulpa light tank concept resembles the American M10 Booker in silhouette and logic, a tracked platform intended to bring tank-like firepower where heavy main battle tanks are too few, too heavy, or too expensive to deploy at scale. And the Booker story is a warning label. After a decade of development and roughly $1.8 billion spent, the US ended up walking away from the program. Proof that light tank can become a procurement trap when requirements creep, weight balloons, and the operational niche remains fuzzy, so the question Kazakhstan must answer is simple. Is it buying a clear capability or importing someone else's unresolved concept? Here is where Tulpar's biggest advantage appears. It is not a single vehicle, it is a platform. The same chassis can take different turrets and mission modules to become an infantry fighting vehicle, an armored personnel carrier, a self-propelled mortar carrier, an air defense platform, a medical evacuation vehicle, a recovery and repair vehicle, a reconnaissance variant, and more. That modularity is often dismissed as marketing, but for a country like Kazakhstan, it is actually strategic. If you can localize production of a common automotive base, engines, transmissions, tracks, suspension, electronics, and then swap mission kits as budgets and threats evolve, you reduce long-term dependence and simplify your logistics pipeline. And in a region where supply chains can become political weapons overnight, logistics is politics by other means. Then there is Alpar, and Alpar changes the conversation entirely. On the same poster, the unmanned ground vehicle appears armed like a compact armored fighting vehicle. A 30mm automatic cannon, two anti-tank guided missiles, and a 7.62 machine gun. Its claim performance, up to 70 km per H and about 500 km range, suggests a platform designed not for slow, cautious engineering support, but for maneuver with mechanized formations. It can link with other unmanned systems. It can be controlled by radio out to roughly 5 km, or via satellite for effectively extended reach. And it can shift roles from logistics to reconnaissance, from UAV carrier to direct fire support. In other words, it is meant to be more than a remote-controlled gun cart. It is meant to be a node in a networked force, but networked warfare comes with uncomfortable questions. If a platform satellite link is unlimited, what happens when that link is jammed, spoofed, degraded by weather, or simply targeted by electronic warfare? If radio control is limited to 5 kilometers, is Alpar intended to fight close to its operators, or will it rely on a chain of relays and drones to push control forward? And if the platform is armed with a 30mm cannon and 80GMs, 
Are we looking at a reconnaissance strike complex where robots probe the front line, trigger enemy fires, and then survive long enough to call in precision strikes? Or are we looking at a system that will be used bluntly as an expendable shield, an armored decoy that forces the opponent to spend expensive munitions on a machine instead of a crew? This is where Kazakhstan's move becomes strategically interesting. Neither Tulpar nor Alpar is a domestic design in the pure sense. They are Turkish autocar products, and what Beskaru is signaling is licensed production. That is not a weakness by default, it is a method. Licensed production can be a controlled form of technology transfer, a way to build industrial competence without paying the full cost of clean sheet R&D. Turkey's defense industry has become highly active in exactly this type of arrangement offering exportable platforms, partnering on local assembly, and using modular design to fit different customer budgets. In Kazakhstan, positioned between major powers and watching supply chains fracture, has every incentive to diversify. The more your armored fleet depends on a single external ecosystem, the more your national security is hostage to someone else's diplomacy. Yet licensed production also creates a new kind of dependency, a tracked platform is not just steel and tracks, it is sensors, fire control software, thermal imaging, stabilization, communications, and a maintenance ecosystem that must function under field conditions. If Kazakhstan assembles hulls locally but key subsystems remain imported, the real bottleneck may not be factory capacity. It may be access to components, spares, and upgrades when the geopolitical climate shifts. And if the light tank configuration relies on an Italian turret, that adds another layer. Multi-country supply chains are resilient in peace and fragile in crisis. The more international the bill of materials, the more complex the risk picture. So what is Kazakhstan really trying to build? The optimistic reading is a balanced modernization path. Wheeled vehicles for rapid internal mobility, track platforms for high-end maneuver, and unmanned systems to absorb risk in the most lethal parts of the battle space. The pragmatic reading is industrial signaling aimed at both domestic legitimacy and export markets. Show capacity, show ambition, and attract regional buyers who want good enough mechanized capability without paying top-tier prices. And the cautionary reading is that Kazakhstan may be stepping into the same conceptual swamp that swallowed the M10 Booker, a light tank that is heavy, expensive, and doctrinally awkward unless it is tied to a precise operational concept. But here is the real takeaway. Even if the poster is only an illustration and the final configurations differ, the direction is unmistakable. Kazakhstan is positioning itself not merely as a consumer of armored systems, but as a producer, one that wants tracked vehicles and armed robots in its portfolio at the same time. That combination reflects the emerging logic of land warfare. Protection must scale, firepower must be flexible, and unmanned systems must integrate rather than operate as gimmicks. The decisive question for 2026 will not be whether Beskaru can start production. It will be whether Kazakhstan can turn these platforms into a coherent force design, where Tulpa variants and Alpa robots are not separate procurement trophies, but complementary tools in a doctrine built for a battlefield that is increasingly transparent, electronically contested, and brutally unforgiving. Because in the end, a factory can build vehicles, only a strategy can turn them into capability.